You were all very gracious to become so quiet as soon as I came up here because my voice is going and I apologize for that. But I didn't want to pass up this great opportunity to meet with you all this evening. My name is Michael Kennedy. I am Vice Provost for International Affairs and Director of the International Institute at the University of Michigan. It is my great pleasure to introduce you to the 12th annual Raoul Wallenberg Lecture. Actually, it is more than a pleasure. It is an honor. It is a great honor because of the man for whom this lecture is named. Raoul Wallenberg was an extraordinary individual who not only acted bravely in the face of horror, he also chose to put himself in a position where personal courage could make a difference. At the invitation of a representative of the American War Refugee Board, and with the diplomatic assistance of the Swedish government. Raoul Wallenberg went to Hungary in July 1944 to find a way to save Jews from Nazi death camps. He hired 400 Jewish volunteers and ordered them to remove the yellow stars that singled them out for deportation and execution. Wallenberg placed them under Swedish diplomatic protection. He invented a special Swedish passport, the Schutzpass, which declared the holder immune from deportation to the death camps. It is estimated that this invention saved 20,000 lives. With American money, he rented 32 buildings in Budapest and declared their residents to hold Swedish diplomatic immunity. On the last days of the war, Wallenberg even confronted a Nazi commander poised to launch a massacre in the Budapest ghetto. Wallenberg warned that Nazi that if he followed through with his plans, Wallenberg himself would assure that Nazi's prosecution for war crimes. That Nazi backed off and another 70,000 lives were saved. Wallenberg himself survived those days, but at the war's end, Soviet agents abducted him when the USSR occupied Hungary. We still don't know for sure what happened to Raoul Wallenberg, but we do know that a great individual made a difference. Although not in the same measure, we make a difference this evening by remembering what he did. However much or little, the University of Michigan helped to form a man so great as Raoul Wallenberg, it is also good to remember that he is one of us. Raoul Wallenberg studied architecture at the University of Michigan in the 1930s. His grandfather, Gustav Wallenberg, recommended that Raoul leave Sweden to learn about American drive and practicality. The grandfather recommended the University of Michigan because he knew it to be a great university, and I like this, but not a snobby university. He also wanted his grandson to become a citizen of the world. Maybe by coming to Michigan, this Swede could transcend the parochialism of his nation. But it was his courage, his morality, and his ingenuity during the last days of World War II that made him far more than a world citizen. 
He is a man to whom thousands owe their lives and in whom many more find inspiration. This is the twelfth time we recognize Raoul Wallenberg's inspiration with the presentation of a medal and citation. In their distinction and diversity, the award's previous recipients, Elie Wiesel, Jan Karski, Helen Suzman, the Dalai Lama, Meep Gies, Per Anger, Marian Pritchard, Kaji Krotem, John Lewis, Nina Lagergren, and Marcel Marceau, remind us that courage and morality find their individual expression in people with very different backgrounds and apparently different commitments. They also remind us that no religion, no race, and no nation have a monopoly on evil. Finally, by learning about their struggle for freedom, human dignity, and social justice, we find hope and inspiration to do more in our common struggle to make this world a better place for all. I not only admire the recipients of the Wallenberg Medal and the man for whom the medal is named, I also respect deeply the committee members who have worked for years to help us remember and to help make this university the kind of place where not only academic accomplishments, but moral courage and public responsibility and intellectual innovation in their pursuit are recognized. For this is a place, this is a university of the world, not only because of where our graduates go, and not only because of where our students come from. It is also a university of the world because it works so hard to recognize the beauty of the world's variety, and it works so hard to understand the causes for and the best ways to address a world in pain. Raoul Wallenberg ennobles this university by our association with him and inspires this university by his example. We are very fortunate tonight to have our new president, Mary Sue Coleman, present the Wallenberg Medal. As she comes forward, I wish to thank her on behalf of the committee for making this evening's presentation. I also wish to thank her on behalf of the university for symbolizing with her presence this evening her own commitment to a universe, university defined by and dignified by its association with Raoul Wallenberg. Thank you. The Raoul Wallenberg Medal honors those who exemplify the motto, one person can make a difference. More than 20 years ago, a young engineer gave up a lucrative career and dedicated himself to reclaiming the lives of South Asia's most vulnerable population, the millions of children who are exploited and abused in a form of modern day slavery. The tireless effort of Kalesh Sadiardi has resulted in the emancipation of more than 34,000 bonded children. Typically, bonding occurs when a desperate family borrows needed funds, often as little as $35, and is forced to hand over a child as surety until the funds can be repaid. But often the money can never be repaid, and the child is sold and resold to different masters. Bonded laborers work in the diamond, stone cutting, and manufacturing industries, especially carpet making, where the children hand knot rugs that are sold in markets around the world, including the United States. Mr. Sadiardi 
has worked relentlessly to free bonded children, to rehabilitate them with vocational training and education, and to marshal the force of public opinion against child labor. The head and founder of the South Asian Coalition on Child Servitude, Mr. Sadiardi, continues to risk his life. Two of his colleagues have been murdered, rescuing children and women from overcrowded, filthy, isolated factories where, where they work in human, inhumane hours and are subject to all kinds of abuse. We commend Mr. Sadiardi for his sacrifice, leadership, and courage, the very qualities of the man whose memory we celebrate here this evening. It is my honor to invite Kalish Sadiardi to the podium to receive the Raoul Wallenberg Medal stamped with the words, one person can make a difference. Mr. Sadiardi. Dear sisters and brothers, I feel extremely honored to receive this medal from this one of the most prestigious university in the name of a great man, Wallenberg. I also feel honored to be included in the list of those people who Mr. Kennedy was just talking about, the portrait of courage and commitment, the symbol of sacrifice and leadership. But my friends, it's not an honor to me alone you are honoring world's more, most vulnerable children, 250 million children, voiceless, nameless, faceless. The children who are sold and bought like animals, trafficked from their home countries and home villages to work as prostitutes, slave labor, and some of them are just trafficked for organ transplantation, where their tender organs, kidneys, and other parts are sold like goods. You are honoring Pau, Sultana, and Candida. Who is Pau? A young lady, teenager, who marched with me in 1998, all across the globe in 100 countries, raising the voice of children who are most exploited. When we organized 80,000 kilometers global march against child labor, demanding a comprehensive international law to combat the worst forms of child labor. This Cambodian girl, when she joined us in Philippines in the march, I noticed her very timid. The rest of the children were chanting slogans, carrying play cards, banners, talking to people, media. But Pau was not. But in a small village, in one afternoon, I was surprised to see that Pau directly came to me and asked a very straight question. She asked, am I still a child? Pau was sold as a domestic child labor 
to one of her relatives. Then she was told to a nightclub, to a brothel, where she has to satisfy dozens of customers whole night, killing her soul, killing her body. And when Pao asked this question to me, I was ashamed. We are living in an era of globalization, space, technology, computers. And a girl is compelled to ask whether she is a child. I put my hand on her head and I said, yes, my daughter, you are very much a child. I saw spark in her eyes and suddenly she started weeping. She wept for an hour or so and I allowed. Next morning, you won't believe, Pao was on the forefront, chanting slogans. No more child exploitation, children want education. No more child prostitution, we want freedom education. Change has come. And no voice could be louder than her chanting. Nobody could stop her across the globe. This is the respect to power. Sultana was a young girl whom we rescued in a group, Bangladeshi girl. She was being taken to Middle East, to Dubai. And she told that she didn't know why she, is, she was going far. But then we came to know that this group was taken for two things. Young children, five, six, seven year old children. And a couple of years back her brother was taken for camel jockey. Some of you might have heard that millions of dollars are put on the sport or a game, what we call the camel race. Thousands of people watch it and the masters of camel put their camels to run. I don't know whom, how and when a barbaric way to make camel run faster was invented. It was tidying down a child, a kid, five, six year old in the back or neck of a camel who is running in the race. If the camel runs faster, child cries, screams louder and moves his hand and legs. And then camels run most faster. And sometimes when the camel is running faster and child is screaming for God and for mom, unfortunately nobody was there to listen. People are clapping, chanting, enjoying that race. Suddenly the child dies. And then the camel's masters are very angry and they curse the mothers that how stupid the parents were give, who gave the birth to such a weak child who died on the way. And so happened with Sultana's younger brother. She was called to identify the body of the brother and since then she became she was under serious trauma. Sultana asked to me, what was the fault of my brother? I had no answer. But today, Mrs. Mary, you are honoring to Sultana. You are honoring to Candida. Last, last summer, Candida from Nicaragua was with me with a group of Latin American, African and Asian children whom I took to the General Assembly special session on children, UN General Assembly. I also organized the children's meetings with the governors of the World Bank and some of the top leaders of this country. Candida, very, very beautiful. Girl selling 
flowers for her master on the streets in her country. She was afraid of men because while selling this flowers on the streets, one can say it's a simple, simple work, but not. She was always abused. So she lost faith in men. Only after a couple of days, she understood that I am her well-wisher. And she asked, I wanted to be a child. I wanted to live like a child. I wanted to go to school too. Friends, United Nations may be observing the day, what they call the day to day of ending slavery. But who says slavery is dead? The medieval is slavery, still alive, still alive in many forms, and the worst victims are world's poorest children. One can say that it is the poverty, but this is not true. Who is responsible for poverty, if at all poverty is responsible for child labor? Are the children responsible? Are they sinners? Is their mistake? No. We adults, our policies, our ways of governance are responsible for poverty, not the children. So why they should be victim of something which is not their sin? And that is also not true. We talk of globalization. And how much money is needed for the education of children in the world? Their liberation and rehabilitation? Just $9 billion, which is four days of military expense. Just four days. $9 billion is nothing but what Americans spent on ice cream just 20% of this. One-fifth of what you spend on ice creams could bring the children out of the clutches of their masters and put them to school. Or what Europeans spend on tobacco. One-sixth of it can make a difference to the whole lot of children in the world. But we are not prepared for that. We talk of globalization. The globalization, I think, I see the globalization have four different trends which are now more and more visible, especially after the September 11th, last year. We all know globalization of market economy, which is bringing good news and sometimes bad news for so, so many people in the poor countries. The globalization of information and technology, what we call the globalization of digits, very fast. Then the third thing which is now on the surface is the globalization of terror. Terror is not something which is occurring in one or other place. It has its own network, it has its own linkages. And these linkages, these networks are growing faster and stronger, unfortunately. But the fourth trend of globalization is very important in silver lining. And that brings hope. That is the globalization of civil society organizations, civil society initiatives, civil society endeavors. And this is challenging all untruth and injustice. The individuals, NGOs, teachers, students, youth, consumers, workers, they are forming their own coalitions at local level and international level. And that is the only way to make the business accountable and the state accountable. And that's the important trend. 
in India where I come from, thousands of years back, our ancient rishis, what we call the people of wisdom, the old saints, holy men, they have conceptualized Globalization by one, with one word, and that is Vasudhaiva Kutumbukam. It means the whole universe is a family. Family. Not just house to live in. And that means the human beings, the beautiful birds and trees and animals and rivers and everything, water, oceans, that is a family. But the prerequisite for that was that one should get rid of a mean mentality that this is mine and that is yours. What we call ayam nijay paro veti ganana lagu chetsam in Vedas. This is mine and this is yours. This is America and that is Ethiopia and that is India and that is Ecuador cannot make the real globalization. We have to get rid of that mentality. It's more spiritual. But the practical suggestion in another place in the same book of Vedas, the book of wisdom, they wrote Sangha Chaddhum Samvadadhum Sambhu Manansi Janatam. The three things, let's walk together, are we prepared to walk together? Let's talk together and let us think together. One segment of human society has gone so far and others are still living in the medieval age. We are not walking together. We cannot make globalization with justice unless we are prepared to walk together and that includes the economic, political and other priorities to be set in that way. We are not able to talk in single tongue. It does not mean that differences will not there. But at least on certain issues, the human society has to be one. And the start would be thinking together. Friends, in that situation, the, again, the worst victims are becoming the children. Not only in India, where I come from, not only in South Asia, where I have been working for several years, but we see the problem of child slavery in a number of countries. Now my organization and my movement and myself is active in more, more than 140 countries. Africa, Latin America, parts of Europe. I was in Romania last week or 10 days back, where we have convened a meeting of some like-minded people from South Eastern Europe, several countries, former Soviet states. And we were discussing on how to address the problem of trafficking of children for prostitution, for organ transplantation, for domestic child labor, the use of children in armed conflicts, illegal armies run by private people, private armies. 16, 17 year old children are taken away from Albania or Macedonia and brought to Italy, for instance or eastern part of, part of Germany, for instance. It's a slavery which is going on. The children are producing wealth for others. But it is not only a humanitarian question. It's a political question. It's an economic question. Because it has been revealed now in several studies, examples of studies are available now which show that there's a vicious circle of poverty, child labor, 
adult unemployment, illiteracy, and population growth. Poverty and child labor have some relation like chicken and egg. If you allow child labor to happen, you allow adults to remain jobless. In South Asia, we have 85 million children in full-time jobs. And we have another 90 million adults jobless. And who are these adults? Most of them are the very parents or family members of these children. Children are preferred because they are the cheapest source of labor. They are physically and mentally vulnerable. They cannot form the trade unions. They cannot go to the court of law or go on a strike, so they are preferred. And the adults remain jobless, their own family members, their parents. It is not the pull factor of poverty, it is the push factor of the greediness of employers and convenience of employers. And that's why it is going on. And if you allow so many children to work, most of them will suffer from one or other disease. While working, they are slowly losing their tender organs of their bodies. They are caught of several ailments, diseases. And finally, they become liability on themselves and liability on the whole country and the whole world. And the same with education. Child labor and education are two sides of the same coin. Illiteracy, I mean. If you allow child labor to happen, they will remain out of school and they will remain illiterate. And they cannot bloom their full potential if they remain uneducated for the rest of their life. We have also seen in a number of countries where child labor is rampant, the poor communities, poor families feel that more children, more earning hands. And they keep on growing more and more children, and that results in further poverty and whatnot, all the problems. The biggest temptation for growing more children in poor communities and poor countries is that children can find job opportunities, job avenues. And they are not considered as liability as we do. They are considered as set. So it's a vital economic question. It's a vital political question. It's not only to enact international laws or national legislation. The most important is the political will to enforce them. The biggest problem is the lack of political will and the lack of adequate social concern. You may say that this is not your problem. In India, the people who live in well-off conditions, they may say that is not their problem. The same thing in South Africa or Kenya, but it's not true. Those days are over, are going to be over very soon when you can say that this is the problem of one part of the world and that is not your problem. No problem in the world are now isolated problems and no solution of any problem in the world in isolation could be found in isolation. I tell you, I was staying with my friend for one day in Washington last, uh, not Washington, in fact, the Maryland. And the young girl, five, five and a half year girl, she was sleeping that day when I came, very relaxedly. And her father told me that she is very relaxed now, that's why she slept yesterday and today. Because for a couple of days, for right, rather a couple of weeks, she was so afraid Then, when her father goes to work in D.C., she used to call at least 20 to 30 times. Are you alive? Are you okay, Papa? She was so afraid. She was so frightened. Because two of the killings took place just outside their house. One was on the Kmart and one was on the bus stop. The driver was killed there. Is it just the problem of one place or one country? Or Maryland alone? Snipers, shootings? 
when some people, mad people, came and attacked the Twin Towers, was it the problem of United States alone? When some people come and attack the Indian Parliament, is it the India's problem alone? Or something is happening in other parts of the world? Whose problem is it? Just after September 11, sometime in the beginning of October last year, I stayed with, a, with another friend of mine in, in Virginia. And I watched that two of their teenager children were very seriously talking on dining table on Al-Qaeda and Taliban and Afghanistan. I was curious. I went to them. I said that I never saw you discussing anything seriously. You were always fighting and either opening MTV or quarreling with your papa to take you to McDonald and all these things. What are you doing now? So the young girl told me that, frankly, uncle, we have never heard or we never bothered to know anything about those things. Even we didn't know where Afghanistan exists. And uh, next day, in fact, I had to address a very selected audience in, on the Capitol Hill. And I told this story to them that, think, this girl has never thought of Afghanistan before. And you and me and many of us have never thought of Afghanistan and many pockets and parts of the world before. Now you are talking to solve this problem in Afghanistan. But think if you have put enough amount of money for good quality, mainstream education, 20 years back, 30 years back, or even 15 years back in most of those countries, then why this fundamentalist, fundamentalism, extremism could have taken place? In that vacuum, the vacuum of good education, quality, mainstream, secular education brings all those problems. And we are not prepared to spend enough money in it. When the world community sat for the first time in 1990 in Jomtian, is it not a shame that before 1990, the international community has never sat on table to discuss on the issue of basic education for the children in the world? Anyhow, they sat. And what they did? They had come, come with a very beautiful slogan, education for all by 2000. By 2000, every child would be sent to, a, to school. That was the slogan. Everybody was happy, pat each other's back, went back home, good pictures, good interviews. And what happened in 10 years' time? In 1990, we had 750 million adults who were totally illiterate. By 2000, we had 880 million. 880 million. In 1990, we had 75 to 80 million adults who have, uh, sorry, children who have never been to school. In 10 years' time, we had 130 million such children. And another 150 million are those children who could not complete their fifth grade, where we have gone in the, those 10 years' time. And the spending on education, the most important thing was that the developing countries, all developing countries agreed on one principle that they are going to enhance their education funding budgets. And so did the industrialized countries. They said that they are going to enhance their Proportion in, or percentage in, overseas development aid. But in 1990, the bilateral funding on education in the ODA was 1.3%, which has come down to 1.1% in 2000. That is a challenging situation. Friends, I don't feel frustrated with that. It's not the matter of being frustrated or pessimistic. The problems are there. But one has to consider those problems as challenges. 
That is the bigger challenge. Why our countries in, in, in the south or why our countries in the north are not prepared to put more money in education for children in the world? And if you don't do, then prepare to face untold problems. Terrorism is one of them. You cannot rest in peace. Sometimes I say that the old saying was, if your neighbor is hungry, you cannot sleep peacefully. But today's truth is that if your neighbor is illiterate, you cannot even sit in peace during the day. Forget about the sleeping at night. It's going so fast, it's growing so fast. Why I'm saying that there is no reason to be pessimistic? I recall my own days when I gave up the career of my life, what was determined by my family, my parents. They had a dream that I should become a bright engineer. That I did. But when I gave up my career, everybody was laughing on me. My mother was crying. Two reasons. Because there was no certainty. And secondly, I was embarking upon on an issue which was a non-issue. In 1980, when I started talking, working, acting on the issue of child servitude, child bonded labor, bonded labor, child labor, these are the words which are not normally heard. Not enough spoken, not enough written, no research. No judicial intervention. There was a British law which was still going on in India, but there was no comprehensive Indian law until that time. The first law against child labor was enacted in only in 1986. Too difficult when you work on an issue which is, in, in, which is hidden under the carpet, which is a non-issue. But I said, but I said no. Each single child whom you see serving you tea on the street side, roadside restaurant, it has a story. He has a story. She has a story. And that story may be the story of the medievalist slavery. That child could have been sold or bought by someone and again to someone else. Just try to go into the life of that. You read beautiful novels. You write wonderful articles research work, academic discussions, analytical discussions, all those things go on. But why don't you sit and talk to a child and get into the life of him or her? And many of them may be slaves. What we call the bonded labor in India and South Asia and rest of the world. When we started conducting secret raids and rescued some children, in undercover operations. It was risky. But it has brought to the light of the world this heinous crime. Let me tell you, the first raid in my life, or first operation of rescuing children which has generated enormous enthusiasm and some sort of self-confidence in me. It was in 1980 when one day an old-looking man came to my office. We started with a small magazine. V means me, full-time, and I had hired a part-time typist, secretary, because I could not type. And we started a journal called Struggle Shall Continue. And the purpose of that journal was to bring the plight of the most oppressed people, perhaps what we call the last person of society, as well as all the initiatives of some individuals and groups who are challenging that injustice. So we wanted to bring the hopes, those success stories, as well as the issues. That was very new, in fact, that time in the human rights arena at least in India and in Asia. 
So that man came to me and as soon as he entered in my room, he suddenly fallen down, fainted. After some time when he was conscious, he told that he and his family were lured away from his home village about 20 years back. And then they have given birth to several children, but these children have never been able to see the outside world. They were working at a brick kiln, brick, fa brick factory, and the employers never allowed to go out, even in the villages. They were confined for altogether. It was shocking for me. I knew the problems of child labor and all this, but I could not understand. This man said that a few days back, his wife overheard some talk going on between some agents of the brothel keepers who came from Delhi and wanted to buy their girl, which was 12 year old. The employer of that brick kiln was negotiating for 16,000 rupees. And the, the prostitute uh, house agent was asking for 11,000 rupees. So the deal could not be materialized. But the, the, when the mother heard this thing, she was under shock and she complained to her husband. He didn't know what to do. Sometime late in the night when the brick-loaded uh, trucks, lorries were going away for selling, he jumped into it. He didn't know where the lorry was going. He reached to a place, looked for some assistance, some help. He didn't know where to go. Luckily, he met a person who knew us. He sent us to my office that we should help. The help, perhaps, for him was to bring his story in my journal and to write letters to some people, some government officials, authorities, to take some action. But I thought that it is not enough. We have to do something. It's, 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 a, it's a big challenge. I could not really sit calm and I could not sleep the whole night. And next morning I decided that I should go and rescue those people physically. It does not mean that we had some guns. I never believe in that. I strong believe, I'm a strong believer of nonviolence since then until now. Even after losing my friends, even after several attacks, and beating, and I have my backbone fracture. All these things, but I didn't, I, I, I'm very committed for nonviolence. So I decided to go without any, any gun or any knife or anything. This man was so frightened, he didn't want to go. I said that we have to rescue that girl at any cost. We hired a small lorry, we went there. This man who was sitting as so-called watchman, he was a gunman having illicit gun, and he threatened, how, how do you dare to come here? There was some heated debate, and finally, this man ran away, and we were very happy, and we br brought all those people in that uh, lorry. But that was not the end of the story. As soon as we wanted to, to leave that place, suddenly a police vehicle uh, came and two or three policemen came down and some other people and this man ran away and brought the not only the police but the honor of the kill and um, they started fighting with us they didn't want to get into argument they started beating us they taken away our camera and threw on the, the brick kiln and um, they beaten everyone, and they throw all those people from the lorry to the earth, and many of them were crying and all these things. We had to come empty hand. Then somebody suggested that we should go to the court of law and file a habeas corpus petition. Our lawyer friend knows, so we went to Delhi and filed a petition. And luckily, some of the pictures which were taken already the film was in the, in the pocket of my friend, so we have given it to um, a daily newspaper. And the judge already read that newspaper. Indian Express is a well-known newspaper. It came from Chandigarh edition of Indian Express. And it says slavery still exists in India. And when we went to the court, the judge was already angry with such thing, and he uh, congratulated uh, us to, to come to the court, and he ordered 
the state government to bring all those people. And when they were brought to Delhi and produced before the court, this girl, her name was, this was a Muslim family, the girl's name was Sabo, the 12-year-old girl who was about to be sold to prostitution, she was not able to recognize the coins or the note, rupee. She has never tasted milk or tea in her life after her mother's breast. She was jumping like a like a monkey on the streets in Delhi because she has never imagined these buildings and cars and all these things, big crowd. And that was the beginning. And we decided that it is not enough to write something about the people, but we have to act. And we, then, I never looked back. And it is not just 34,000, which is the old figure, which is given uh, in some of the uh, literature in the past, but we have liberated over 60,000 children so far. And let me tell you, each time when I liberate a child and bring back to, to his mother or her mother, who lost all her hope, and the child lost her, all, her, all his hope to, to ever come back and sit with the mother or father, each time it happens, we feel that it is a small victory of liberty over slavery. Each time I feel that we are moving far, it is not the question of one or 10 or 20,000 people. We are bringing the issue which nobody could stop. The governments have to change the law. The governments have to put new schemes, and it happened. Number of civil society organizations were born, NGOs, who are working on child labor in South Asia, and India particularly. Wonderful landmark Supreme Court and High Court judgments were delivered on this issue. Things moved, but it was not enough. When I realized that it is not just a South Asian situation, we and, and, and I had a chance to visit some of the African and at least one or two Latin American countries, I decided to launch a worldwide movement because then I realized that it is, it is better in India or South Asia that the issue is unearthed and the people at least know that this is a serious matter. We cannot simply neglect it. But in a number of West African countries where I traveled intensively, I found that it was a non-issue. In, a small country, in a small countries like Ethiopia or Eritrea or Ghana or uh, other countries. Similarly, in Ecuador or, uh, or uh, Brazil, uh, Peru, there was something in Peru but not much. And then we decided to organize this worldwide global march against child labor, which I just referred. The people laughed at me. What, they said that, what, what are you talking about? You will march with the children? And children from 50 or 60 or 70 countries will be marching with you? Are you kidding? How is it possible? How dangerous it is? You have to pass through Cambodia, you have to pass through Vietnam, you have to pass through a number of countries, Sudan, where you could be killed or anything could happen. And who is going to allow you to pass through? How would you get visas for those children? How you find these children? Whether the parents of these children will allow, allow them to go with you? Thousands of questions. But friends, I were determined. I thought that it is one of the most effective way. I learned something from Mahatma Gandhi in my country. I learned something from Martin Luther King in this country. I learned something from the civil rights movement in the United States in the past. I learned something from the ancient endeavors in my country. Buddhism and others. And then I thought that let us go to the victims instead of sitting and talking in air-conditioned rooms and discussing and debating on the issue. Better to go to them. Better to work with them. Better to take with them. Take them. And the most powerful is the vocal face of a victim than the advocate. 
And when these children were marching with us across the world and we reached in Geneva, where we demanded to ILO that there should be a comprehensive international law to stop first forms of child labor. No delay, no compromise, no excuse. Hundreds of children keeping play cards, chanting slogans like power. They entered into the podium of the United Nations, what they call the Palacia Pel Tell Nations, the main hall of UN in Geneva. I tell you, it was such a big shock for everyone. The head of the nations, the ministers, the member countries' leaders, all of them were sitting from over 100 countries, 180 countries or so. Everybody was under shock. When the children, the young girls and boys, victims of slavery and bonded labor, prostitution, they said, what do you want to discuss now? We are here. Do you allow it to happen? If not, stop it. Pass a law at least. And let me tell you, sisters and brothers, that it was for the first time in the United Nations that there was no opposition to it. The following year, the ILO Convention 182 was passed in presence of then President Bill Clinton. That was signed by all the member states, no absconding, no opposition. No one has moral courage to say to the children that we are not prepared for it. It was enormous, it was tremendous. So we have hope. We have all reasons to be optimistic. We have not seen 10, 15 years back that the big companies including Nike and Reebok and, and uh, Coca-Cola and uh, Adidas and such big companies will be compelled to make their internal code of conduct or they will be pressurized by the consumer organizations to make sure that they are not using child labor in their factories. I, I, I will not say that everything is solved, but it has become a big issue. When we first launched the carpet consumers campaign in Germany and United States in uh, late 80s, there was no much consumers concern on the issues of child labor. But slowly, it gained momentum, and finally it has become like a wildfire. Everywhere the consumers started demanding that we don't want the goods produced by child labor. It's necessary because many of you might be using the beautiful hand-knotted carpets from South Asia in your drawing rooms, and you don't know that you are putting your legs on those carpets which are produced by slave labor, children. You might be playing with those soccer balls. I, was, I, I, I heard that there, was, there is a big uh, football match going to take place here in the weekend. Over 100,000 or 113,000 people are going to watch it. But how many of them and how many of you know that many of these footballs, soccer balls, are made by child laborers and children in extremely appalling conditions? I work with those children in Pakistan and India and some other places where the children say, those who stitch football, when they are stitching with the needles, the needle may go in their fingers and the blood drops come. They just clean it on the football and finally the big brands clean them, polish them, put their stamp and sell it in your market. And these children say that they never dreamed to play with those footballs. They never touch those footballs in their legs. Is it not a shame? The apparels, the garments, the shoes you might be wearing, these children live barefooted for the rest of their life. This is the shame. But the consumer concern is going, growing. 
And while I'm, while I'm sitting and talking in the group of this galaxy of intelligentsia and concerned citizens, I'm not just lecturing. I'm not a lecturer. I'm not a preacher. I'm an ordinary human being. But I strongly believe that this injustice must not happen. Must not happen. And if we are committed, if we are pledged to do, we can bring the change. Any one of us. And it is necessary not for others. It is necessary, it is essential for ourselves to sustain ourselves, to ensure peace in our lives, in our future. And that's why it is necessary. Friends, let me conclude with a saying which I read in my childhood that it is not good to cry if you are born in darkness. It's always better to light a lamp because the biggest things, if you bring the elephant in this room and make this room dark, nobody will know where the elephant is standing unless he cries or you go and just hit him. But if you light a lamp somewhere in the corner of this dark room, if you make this room dark, even if this room is dark for centuries, if you make just a small candle somewhere, Light it. It is a proof in itself. Candle need not to say that I am candle. You will understand the light is burning there. And each one of us have human compassion. Have enormous energy and light within. The most important thing is that how we bring it out. I am thankful to all of you once again because this is a great recognition for, for those children and my own children, in fact, and my own wife and my mother. My wife was always afraid and my children, since they are born, they were scared. Every time when I go to conduct a secret operation, an undercover raid to rescue other children, they pray, God, my young daughter and my son, they are not too young now, but I'm talking about 10, 15 years back, or five, six years back. They used to pray that, oh God, the Papa should come back safely. And I never brought them bad news. I always brought good news. And I telephoned from long distances. Very difficult sometimes in India to make the telephone those times. Nowadays, it's easy. It's, you can make long distance calls from any remote villages in India. It's technology, technological revolution. But those days difficult. I had to walk or go to find a place where I can just call and confirm that I'm alive. And they were the ones who were facing a lot of threat calls all the time when I am away. Away of home. And my mother, who cried when I gave up my career of an, of an engineer, but all the time she is proud when she hear that I got some prize, some recognition, and when she see uh, my face in the television, uh, hear something in radio or, or newspapers in India. Thank you very much. Thank you. We have a little time in case people have any questions or comments they would like to share with Mr. Satyarthi because I know that he is 
lit many lamps in many parts of the world and very much in this room this evening. But I know that he would like to be able to go back and tell his mother that not only did he get awards, but he got some really good comments and support as well. So may I invite you all to raise any questions or pose any issues? So. Yeah, yeah, very good question. Actually, we try to make sure in each single case that these children should not fall back into slavery or, or bonded labor. And that's why we started three uh, transit rehabilitation centers, residential centers, and a number of other special schools for those children in their uh, habitats or in their villages. Uh, so when these children come to us, of course, they are uh, traumatized, they are timid, they are in very bad mental and physical shape. And the biggest challenge for us is how to make them feel that they are still children. And then we, uh, we give them some uh, basic education, vocational training, uh, social education. But my dream, which is definitely coming true in many cases, was that these victims themselves should become their own liberators and leaders. Should not always be Kailas Satyarthi or other people who uh, remain the heroes and liberators, but the children themselves. And I'm proud to say that uh, dozens of the former child slaves are now our activists and leaders, elected leaders in the villages, and helping other children, those who passed out from our training rehabilitation centers. So we have microphones that can get so, please, let's, um, there's a question right here. Right here too. So, would you? Good. So, this gentleman here, and then this woman here. Please. Thank you very much for a very inspiring talk. Uh, may I ask, what is the long-term economic solution to this problem? It's okay to free the children, but what do you do next? Do the families change attitudes, bring social, vocational, other you know training and things to get them rehabilitated fully? Yeah. Well, there's no just one uh, single solution. It's a. Uh, it's, uh, a multi-pronged uh, approach which is needed, but the most important key is the free compulsory quality education for all children, which is not too difficult uh, in any poor country if they, are, uh, they have that political will. So education is the key to it. But uh, besides that, uh, uh, some sort of social awareness, uh, consciousness raising, um, more economic activities in the child labor prone areas, the legal enforcement, the consumers boycott. So there are several ways to, uh, to pressurize the industries and government to do those things. But it is illegal in most of the countries. So it is a question of respecting the laws of the land and international laws, that's all. That was a very inspiring um, lecture. I should really congratulate you for that. But I was just wondering, because of the international labor organization law against child labor, we have seen, especially in Bangladesh, that most of the women workers who are below the age of 15, if they're not employed in the garment industry, they turn to prostitution. So what is the solution for that? <laughs> it's, a, it's such a big propaganda by the industry. I'm sorry to say, uh, we have been closely working in Bangladesh uh, with the Bangladeshi Garment Manufacturers Association as well as the Sishu Adhikar Forum Bangladesh. We, we have a strong ties in Bangladesh. And uh, we were working since uh, then when Senator Tom Harkin has introduced a bill in the in US Senate and uh, Judge Brown brought a similar bill in, in the Congress here and I, I have been closely working with them. And there were a lot of, lot of hue and cry by the industry but uh, the truth was that those 60,000 young ladies who have been liberated, of course, under pressure, and there was no enough homework to rehabilitate them. That was true. But not a single of them have gone to, to prostitution, not a single. And in turn, most of the mothers and other people found the job in place of those girls, and they are better, better off than UNICEF, ILO, uh, some of the uh, European foundations, uh, the industry, Bangladeshi garment industry itself, and the NGOs, 
uh, formed a good coalition which has taken responsibility for the education and rehabilitation of all those who were retrenched, uh, the young boys and girls. So the solution was there, but the, the, the propaganda was absolutely wrong. So I think we might have time for a couple more comments up here, sir. Yeah, um, I was wondering, as far as what we could do to help the uh, solution, like, do you think by not purchasing products by the companies and corporations that use slave labor, labor would that actually make a difference? Well, this could be a, an important tool, but not the ultimate solution. Because once we call for the boycott, um, we have to give some alternative to the industry, to the consumers, and to the children themselves. That we have been able to do in case of carpet industry. Where we called for the selective boycott, we also called for a selective promotion for the child labor free carpets. And we introduced a monitoring system called Rugmark. Rugmark is a social voluntary label put or knitted in the backside of the carpets, which ensures that this particular rug is not made by children. And under that scheme, uh, the children affected are given full rehabilitation, education, training, etc. And uh, that has become a very good solution for the industry also because from India alone, over 2.6 million carpets, rugs with this rug mark have been sold in the last four or five years. So it's a good promotion for child labor free goods. So that is one way, uh, definitely. But you can do a lot. For instance, a concerned citizen uh, in, in many universities in many places in the world, some of the uh, students and teachers came together and formed some uh, study circles or concern groups. Uh, they started getting in contact with the, uh, the movement, the Global March Against Child Labor, uh, which has its website. We also invite interns and volunteers uh, to work in the International Secretariat of the Movement in India, but also we place them to other places, and some of them are placed to work with the children directly in Asia or uh, other countries. So there are several ways. But the most important thing is that somebody has to take initiative and, and, and uh, further it uh, as an as a informal uh, way, but a group of some individuals could be formed to take it further. Let's take one last question, please, sir. Hello. Yes, uh, thank you. As you know, many people in this country don't know very much about these issues about which you are speaking, and my, my question really is in that regard. In the United States, the word slavery has a tremendous resonance. And it's sometimes you've spoken of slave children, and sometimes you've just spoken of child labor. And I'm wondering, is there, a, is there, is there, is there an important distinction? One can liberate a slave, but if a, if a, if a 10 year old has to work, liberation is, is not the term that would be used. Yeah, well, Actually, uh, generally speaking, we have three major categories of uh, child laborers. One is the working children, means the children who are uh, learning something or helping the family or supporting the family. But that is not an obstacle to their health or freedom or education. That is child work, which is allowed. The children can work and learn everywhere. It should not be obstacle to their childhood. Another one is the child labor where the children are working at the cost of their education, sometimes at the cost of their health and, uh, and, and the freedom. And the most uh, hard or heinous is the child slavery, where the children have no choice uh, and they are sometimes sold uh, from one to another master. Uh, so they lost all kind of freedom. So that is the worst form. So there are several categories like that. So we wanted to, um, to fight against all forms of child labor, of course not against child work. But that, uh, that, that prevails in different ways in different forms in many countries, including the child labor is, is, is a problem in the southern coast of the United States also, where we have been working very closely with the agriculture and farm workers and others where not only the migrated children from Latin America, but also some of the local children are working in, in hazardous occupations, uh, they are handling um, pesticides and, and machines and tools. Uh, the young children, 11, 12 year old children, and some are working in the sweatshops in, uh, in New York City itself. So uh, we are quite not only aware but active in that. We could probably go on for quite some time talking in public. 
Um, but there will be a great opportunity for us to have a more intimate conversation with Mr. Satyati in the reception. But before we go, I would like you to say three things. One thing is that one of the places I've learned about Mr. Satyati is in a wonderful book called Speak Truth to Power, compiled by Kerry Kennedy Cuomo. This is a remarkable collection, not only because our guest is in it, but because of the company that he keeps. And in fact, it was a wonderful opportunity that we had here because one of our Polish colleagues, Bigniew Bujak, was also a member of this uh, Speak Truth to Power, and it was only through this particular Polish connection that this Irish Kennedy finally made the connection with that Irish Kennedy and to come to appreciate this man of the world. So please take a look at that book, but there's another volume that you should uh, take a look at. One way to learn about Raoul Wallenberg, his courage and his Michigan experience, as well as other Wallenberg recipients before tonight is to read the book Remembering Raoul Wallenberg, which is available actually for purchase this evening in the lobby. This moving volume recalls the best of what Michigan can be and what each of us ought to be. But as I speak of this inspiration, I must in the end return to the committee whose work has typically gone unnamed. But two members of the committee have retired this year, and I think it's quite appropriate to recognize them by name. University of Michigan Professor of Art John Rush designed and donated this extraordinary medal. His gift endures and shall endure for as long as this medal is given to remarkable people like Mr. Satyati. Helen Irene Butter, University of Michigan Professor Emerita of Public Health, a Holocaust survivor, and a founding member of the committee that established this award is also retiring. Her guiding spirit and tireless efforts on behalf of the Wallenberg Project will be hard to match, but with the trajectory she and her colleagues have laid, they have indeed succeeded in their wish to remember Raoul Wallenberg in the most appropriate way one can imagine. Thank you, John Rush. Thank you, Irene Butter. And on behalf of the University of Michigan and all those who are newly inspired by the memory of Rule Wallenberg, I want to thank you, Mr. Satyati, for enabling this conversation this evening. So let us go to the atrium. It's a beautiful place, and let's reconvene there.